So we know the role of tyrosine phosphorylation at the receptor is important. And the question is, um, what is the mechanism um, whereby you, you trigger signaling from the receptor? So there, there were two schools of thought. The, the first school of thought was that um, once you activate the tyrosine kinase at the receptor, well, it would simply phosphorylate a whole bunch of target proteins in the cytosol. And that seemed the most plausible thing that would, would, that would occur. But the, the other school of thought um, was that, well, actually, the next important thing in the signaling pathway was the actual phosphorylation of the cytoplasmic domains of the receptor. So it was the phosphorylation of the receptor that then was important in signaling. So two schools of thought. One is that the receptor phosphorylates things in the cytosol, and that's important. The other school of thought was, well, the receptor is phosphorylating itself, so maybe that's the next stage that's important in signaling. That's going to drive something. So, um, and I'll explain to you now which of those two schools of thought um, proved the most um, correct. So we've talked about um, the EGF receptor before, and I've shown you this slide in, in an earlier um, um, movie, an earlier lecture. And what, what, we, um, what we discussed was the fact that we, um, SARC was one of the first oncogenes recognized, and the SARC protein is a tyrosine, has a tyrosine kinase domain, and, and this, this tyrosine kinase domain is homologous to a, the cytoplasmic domain of one of these receptor molecules. And we're looking at the EGF receptor now, um, and we're looking at this as being the, the trigger of signaling that's going to lead down to the RAS molecule. This protein was the first one studied, so we'll just quickly look at what's known about um, the SARC molecule, and then we'll transfer that knowledge to understanding the receptor. So mutations in the SARC protein, it was one of these viral oncoproteins that was identified early on in the story. Um, when you transform cells with a mutated SARC, it leads to radically altered cell shape. It leads to change in glucose being pumped, you know, um, from the surrounding media. Um, cells um, lose their anchorage dependence and they become anchorage independent, and they lose their contact inhibition and gain the ability to form tumors. So, SARC was affecting a lot of things, and it turns out that. Um, SARC was a tyrosine kinase, and um, it also contained groups in, in the SARC protein that were phosphorylated themselves. So it was phosphorylated, and it could phosphorylate either itself or other things. And um, so this idea of autophosphorylation to regulate itself is an important metaphor because that's what the 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 tyrosine kinase receptors are doing, they're autophosphorylating themselves to regulate themselves. And it's the growth factor that triggers this autophosphorylation of the receptors. And um, you know, this notion came out of studying this, you know, um, this SARC protein. So here is a cartoon showing the, you know, the X-ray crystallography structure of SARC. And like all proteins, there are different domains that make up the tertiary structure of the protein. And there's, um, a, there's a tyrosine kinase domain, so where the ATP is binding, that's going to be the catalytic site that phosphorylates other proteins. And it's also got, um, you know, SH stands for you know, the, the SARC homology. So this is SARC, and they, they've got a SARC domain here called SARC homology domain 1, 2, and three. And now we know that SARC can auto-regulate itself. And it can auto-regulate itself because the SH2 domain can bind to the, a phosphorylated residue on the protein. So it was this SH2 domain that we're going to look at in a bit more detail. So 
This is a domain that's shared amongst many signaling proteins, first identified in SARC, but contained within many signaling proteins. And the SH2 domain can bind to a phosphorylated tyrosine. So people think of the SH2 domain as being something that can bind to a phosphorylated tyrosine. Okay? And the binding here is regulated, if you like, by these um, adjacent residues, you know, these amino acid residues adjacent to the tyrosine. They, 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 these residues fit into this in like a lock and key, and then the, um, the, the SH2 domain can bind to the phosphorylated tyrosine. So there's, there's over 100 distinct proteins that have domains that are very similar in structure to what was identified in SARC. So here's a range of proteins here. Um, we have SARC itself, contains an SH2 domain. Um, GRB2, which we've mentioned in um, that join together the signaling cascade, has SH2 domains. So we now have this idea of proteins being able to recognize phosphorylated tyrosines. So we know that the receptor phosphorylates itself and then these other proteins can bind to the receptor because there are domains that bind to phosphorylated tyrosines. So binding domains that are carried um, by various proteins, I'm only going to really talk to you about SH2 domains and it's a domain that can bind to a phosphorylated tyrosine. But it's important to know that there are other binding domains these proteins have. There are PTB domains that can bind also to phosphotyrosines. There are SH3 domains which can bind to proline rich regions of other proteins. And there's a whole bunch of other um, binding domains that proteins can carry. Okay, so let's try and put this into context. So earlier on I was saying when a tyrosine kinase receptor gets activated through binding to a, um, a growth factor, one of the first things that's I notice is that it autophosphorylates itself. Okay? And it turns out that this autophosphorylation of itself is much more important in the signaling pathway rather than the tyrosine kinase phosphorylating other things, it's the tyrosine kinase autophosphorylating itself that's the really important thing in cell signaling. So um, here's one um, chain of the EGF receptor. Typically tyrosine kinases are either homodimers or heterodimers of two domains, two proteins. And when you activate this by binding a growth factor, typically there's a bunch of sites on the cytoplasmic tail of this receptor that can be phosphorylated. So, there's a bunch of tyrosines indicated by Y here, so Y, 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 and all these different tyrosines. And these phosphorylated tyrosines can be bound by these different enzymes. And we're going to look at, I'm just highlighting one region here, which is a couple of tyrosines that when they're phosphorylated, they can be bound by GRB2. And um, GRB2 is going to signal to the SOS, which is going to signal to RAS. So, to get a signal from the receptor to RAS, an important step in that signaling is the phosphorylation of tyrosines, which are then recognized by GRB2. Okay, and then GRB2 recognizes SOS, and then SOS can recognize RAS. Okay, so we're starting to get specificity of proteins recognizing each other in response to a signal. Okay, so you've got this response to a signal that leads to autophosphorylation of tyrosine residues by um, the kinase domain within the receptor leading to phosphorylated tyrosine which then binds GRB2. So GRB2 contains an SH2 domain which is a domain that can bind to phosphorylated tyrosine GRB2 doesn't have any enzyme activity, it's an adapter molecule, but 
it can bind to the proline rich region of SOS because it has SH3 domains. And I've got a diagram that shows this. So, so here's the GRB2 that can bind to phosphorylated tyrosine. It's also got SH3 domains that can bind to SOS. So starting at the beginning now, um, we've got a growth factor that can activate a tyrosine kinase receptor that can then be bound by GRB2, that can then bind to SOS through these SH3s, that can then activate RAS because SOS is a guanine exchange factor. So look at this diagram here. This is a nice one. It shows that the receptor is a dimer. And in this case, we just think it's a home, we'll look at it as a homo dimer. So you've got two chains that are the same. When these chains bind to the growth factor, it brings the chains into close proximity. So it brings this tyrosine kinase into close proximity to phosphorylate this residue. And it brings this tyrosine kinase in close proximity to phosphorylate residues on this chain. So you get this trans autophosphorylation. Trans meaning one side phosphorylates the other, as opposed to cis would be the same. Okay, you've got trans phosphorylation, and this this these kinase domains are activated by binding the growth factor to phosphorylate the other chain. So now you have a phosphorylated tyrosine here, which can be recognized by the GRB2 protein. And we know from studies in SARC that GRB2 contains an SH2 domain which binds to a phosphorylated tyrosine. So this can only happen because of the growth factor. Okay, so growth factor has now led to GRB2 binding the phosphotyrosine. GRB2 has these domains here that can bind to SOS. And we know from studies in Drosophila and yeast that SOS is a guanine exchange factor. And the guanine exchange factor can cause RAS in an inactive state to exchange its GDP to GTP, which puts RAS into an active state. So now we have signaling from an external growth factor through to activation of RAS. And that's now going to drive growth and gene expression. Okay, um, I guess another couple of points that are shown in this diagram that we've already discussed is that RAS um, is anchored to the inner plasma membrane and that puts RAS in the same plane, if you like, in close proximity to these receptors. And it's just um, these couple of a couple of extra factors here, these adapter proteins, that then are the, are the molecular Lego that link the RAS and the SOS through to the receptor and, and thus the growth factor. So here we have the upstream signaling down to activate RAS. And just as a reminder, when RAS is bound to the um, GTP, it's the extra phosphate here that um, interact with the um, glycine 12 um, residue or residue 62, I think it was, a couple of other residues, which caused this part of the RAS protein to flip out, to loop out into the cytosol. And it's this change in conformation of RAS to, um, to effectively um, change the structure of this effector loop and this loop here, this loose bit of um, protein backbone, can flip out and it can interact with other proteins to activate them. Okay, so RAS is not a tyrosine kinase, RAS is not being phosphorylated, but RAS has a, a nucleotide um, embedded in its structure and it's the, um, the GTP form of the nucleotide which changes the RAS structure so that this activation loop or this effector loop is exposed. And then there's a, actually a couple of these effector loops. And this structure of RAS can then interact with downstream signaling to turn on gene expression.